Good morning, and thank you for being with us for our uh, April edition of our uh, webinar series, Across. And I guess this also is, as we wrap up our semester here, is our final, will serve also as our final uh, craft aid uh, for, for our, our term. Uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Dominique Gagnon, who is a professor in the School of Human Genetics here at Laurentian University, fresh off uh, a West Coast swing, uh, presenting several papers at a conference uh, in San Diego, uh, landing early this morning, as I understand it. So thankfully not talking about fatigue and sleep deprivation in the workplace this morning, but talking rather about uh, thermal stress and the occupational environment. Uh, if you have any questions for those of you joining us online, uh, you can type, there is a chat box that you can type, and I will uh, triage the questions for uh, Dr. Gagnon at the conclusion of his uh, presentation. For those of uh, us here in the room, uh, you can either wave at uh, Dominique and ask a, you know, a question if, you, if it's pressing, and if not, we'll hold them off to the end. So, with that, uh, Dominique. Thanks, Caleb. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you for being here. Um, so again, today we're going to be discussing briefly about the occupational environment and how thermal stress do influence you within, again, that particular working environment, whatever that is. We're going to go uh, review briefly what acute injuries and illnesses are generally provided to you or things to be careful of in the workplace, but we want to go a little bit beyond that and see um, some chronic effects that uh, thermal stress can have on you. So first, let's define a working environment. Uh, and a classic example that we have, of course, here in Northern Ontario would be mining. So underground mining can be, again, many kilometers on the ground and based on various factors, including, of course, uh, bedrock geothermal gradient, uh, the many machines that miners have to use, uh, a lot of electrical equipment. Then this is an environment that can be really, really warm. Uh, awareness of the difficulties of working in hot environments have led to many industrial advances uh, in the mining ventilation as well as cooling. Uh, but heat issues are still far from being fully mitigated and any underground miners is still considered chronically exposed to heat. Uh, and again, in non-ventilated mines, uh, not necessarily that deep, but we still have mines around the world that have temperatures reaching in the 60s, which is quite high. Another example associated with, again, Northern Ontario would be uh, fire rangers, which is some work that is being done here at Crosh. Um, uh, teams across eastern and western Ontario face extremely hot and extremely dangerous environments and in some cases depending on the number of fires they have every year some years it's just a few but some years again they have 50 and 60 fires the uh, thermal and physical load can be extremely extremely heavy and chronically uh, and be chronic for nearly the entire summer on the opposite end of the spectrum we also have some open pit mines, probably for wool and coal mining, uh, with workers exposed to sub-zero temperatures. Now, since many of these mines are located in northern regions in Russia, Canada, and Scandinavia, so some temperatures, of course, are reaching in the minus 20s, minus 30s, and in some cases, even in the minus 40s. Uh, Consider the coldest mine on Earth, the Sadrukah mine in Russia has a reported minimum average temperature of nearly minus 47 degrees Celsius. No? This is not the peak, this is actually the average lower court, uh, recorded. Uh, so overall working conditions sometimes uh, associated with mining camps even in those remote locations can be quite challenging as well. So not the mining work itself, but also the living conditions that surround the mining work. Uh, and this is presented here, for example, in uh, Nunavut by Rincon Island, uh, Inlet, sorry. Uh, but this is seen across uh, Northwestern Territories and Nunavut. And of course, we have many other, other occupations that, you know, do, um, uh, that are under occupational challenges. So we have uh, construction work, so during the warm summer days, can be quite warm working on the roads. And of course, during the winter time, working on lines or again, working on construction can be quite challenging and cold. In the uh, military, sometimes in occupation that we do tend to forget that we have a lot of men and women working there. So uh, they do generally run a lot of drills in the Arctic during the winter time, which can be quite difficult. And subsequently sent to uh, missions in the Middle East in extremely warm environments. A few years ago, NATO was somewhat interested to determine the working conditions in some of these soldiers working in tanks and using uh, fairly simple technologies that we have here, which is uh, remote wireless eye buttons 
they were able to determine that peak temperatures during the day reached the low 40s in the tanks. And we're talking soldiers with full heavy garments, and that was had to be sustained for many, many hours. So very, very demanding environments. And back to you. So this is the world that we mostly live in, the working environment that we find ourselves in today, which is not just a byproduct of windows and walls, but it's also the byproduct of many, many years of thermal research to try to determine optimal work capacity and comfort. Um, even though we have all the core temperature that's somewhat ranging around the same, we all feel cold or hot at different temperatures. Uh, we also feel, um, depending on, Sorry, let me restart that a little bit more freshly. Um, we all sense temperature slightly differently. And so in this environment like this today, or most public offices, you have a, a set temperature of approximately 22 degrees Celsius. And in some institutions, it's even a bylaw. Um, however, for some people, they always feel a little bit chill. And for some people, it's always a little bit too warm. So it's never really perfect. And so really having an impact in the workplace, as soon as you get a little bit warm, and so some of these responses right away while well, some people start to sweat and then you get a little bit uncomfortable and you get tired a little bit faster and thereby it heavily affects your working capacity. And oppositely, as soon as you get a little bit cold or you feel cold, you behaviorally start to think, what can I do to get myself warmer? Uh, where can I get my shirt or can I start moving a little bit? And again, this lack of comfort really influences productivity. So overall, so let's do a bit of a review on basic thermophysiology and how do we stay warm? Um, as, as I've said, so the typical adult will have a core temperature of approximately 37 degrees Celsius, and this ranges from person to person, plus or minus about half a degree. Um, and this is the results of integration of signals from your periphery, so tip of your fingers all the way to your central nervous system that's sending a lot of signals to a specific part of your brain that's really trying to maintain that optimal core temperature at all times. And it doesn't take much of a deviation from that specific set to make your, work, uh, make your brain work and try to fix it. So just a change of 0 0.01 degrees Celsius is enough for your body to try to readapt to the new environment. So it's always an ongoing process. And how does it do so? Well, I mean, we do have some mechanisms that help us gain heat, and we have some mechanisms that help us lose some heat. And so if you want to lose some heat, you're getting really warm, evidently, so we have what's called conduction. So conduction being uh, your body being pressed against a hard object, and if it's a cold object, uh, you will tend to pass some of uh, your body heat to the object. And one of the good examples I have is you go on a nice fall day, watch a football game outside, and you have your warm jacket, and you have your toque, and you're really warm, but you sit on a cold metal bench. And just sitting on that cold metal bench that has a high density, cold uh, density, you're actually transferring a lot of your heat down to the bench, and over time you get really, really cold. Uh, you also have evaporation, which is a very powerful mechanism, so sweating will help you release a lot of heat. Radiation, so the thermal motion of charged particles of your body, and generally in an environment like this, you are passing or you're emitting radiating heat to the environment. And finally, convection, and this is a mechanism we're going to come back a little bit more later. So this one is losing heat via a moving medium, and we're talking primarily of air and water. And so you're getting into a day like today, and it's approximately maybe three, four degrees outside with no wind. It kind of feels warmish, but as soon as the wind starts to kick in, you start to feel really, really cold. And this is even more powerful in a, uh, in a water environment. Water can actually suck a lot more heat out of you than air, than air can. And for anybody who's been participating in the cold water immersion that we do in Ramsey in the winter can tell you that just 30 seconds in the water, you feel quite cold already and you want to get up. If anybody wants to try that again next year, we do it every year. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> Concerning how to gain heat when you get cold, again, we do have basal metabolic rate. So by just sitting there right now, by just being able to stay alive and your cells to function, a byproduct of cellular mechanism is heat. Um, if you're starting to be a little bit too cold, then of course you have shivering that's kicking in, and this is the involuntary muscle contraction that's just trying to generate that extra heat, and we can technically generate five times more heat than basal metabolic rate at maximum shivering intensity, which I don't recommend to anybody because it's very uncomfortable. And feeding, of course, every time you eat, you tend to get a little bit warmer, and you can probably see that after a meal, you sit down and you kind of feel not necessarily sweaty, but just a little bit warmish, and that's normal because your body needs to work a little bit harder to try to digest the food. And the final component, which is the most critical one, of course, is physical activity. And we tend to forget about that one quite easily. Physical activity, you can exercise moderate to severe, moderate to heavy exercise intensity, 
that's essentially enough to lit up your entire house. We're talking about over a thousand watts of energy. Um, and again, we do have a program here in EVL, and I love the winter camping trip where people, you know, you get cold and you just feel like you just need to add layers and just kind of bundled up a little bit. Where the best mechanism is just to get moving. And as soon as you get moving, you get warm really quickly because you, you're a little powerhouse. And surprisingly enough, in the plane yesterday when I was coming in, there was a researcher sitting beside me and his main field of work was to develop electrical gradient patches on clothes to actually harness humans' energy. So all the heat that you produce would be able to be transferred into little patches that can be subsequently used for other purposes. Uh, and this is something that's been in talk for, for decades already because we are essentially just big, all of us, big batteries. Uh, the next few slides, so this is a bit of a review of health and safety guidelines as recommended by national health and safety bodies such as NIOSH and COSH. And, and again, we're going to go how they are somewhat simple but somewhat quite related to our daily living. And so in terms of heat stress and injuries and illnesses, so what you would have in terms of severity would be an increase in maybe some heat cramping, some fatigue. Uh, you start to get thirsty, um, and some of us maybe a lot of sweating. And if you still want to continue your work, if you still want to get going and you want to push through this, then some of us might suffer what's called heat exhaustion. Heat exhaustion at this point is the, the close to the inability to perform any work whatsoever. And this is generally associated with heavy headaches as well as nausea, and some people will start vomiting, uh, chills and goosebumps. In the worst of the cases, if you keep pushing without stopping, and again, um, with the work with the fire rangers, uh, as well in, in, in some other industries, again, at some point, when you start sweating, you start to get confused, and in the worst of the worst, losing consciousness, in this case, you're looking at a heat stroke. Now, let's remind ourselves that in the work industry, again, heat stroke are extremely, extremely rare. Even heat exhaustion are extremely, extremely rare, because people know fairly well uh, the effects of of heat over time and as soon as they start to be really thirsty and really fatigued it's already a sign that you just stop working relaxing rehydrating and cooling down and so again heat exhaustion quite rare and heat stroke extremely rare in a working environment on the cold side of things and this is one of my favorites for the same health and safety um, bodies regulating bodies one of the very main element of concern for them is people suffering from hypothermia and I can guarantee that most of us, if not anybody in this building has never suffered from meal hypothermia. And the reason is before you get to that point, you go through a lot of steps that are really telling you that you're way too cold and you should stop. Hypothermia does not set in until you're approximately 35 degrees Celsius. Before you get to that point, your metabolism has increased significantly and you are shivering a lot. And I'm not talking just like shivering that makes you feel uncomfortable. I'm talking shivering to a point where you can't walk or move effectively. And up, up, up until that point, and shivering starts to then decrease, this is where you actually get into a hyperthermic state. And this is still only what's called moderate hyperthermia. So it's not, while it can be very unpleasant, it's not really that dangerous. Um, and again, so if you get to that point, again, severe hyperthermia right now, again, so you start shivering as much, uh, consciousness starts to get clouded, and only 28 degree and below, this is where you're looking at severe hyperthermia, where again, motion ceases, and again, there are some individual cases uh, beyond that point that some people have survived, some people haven't. But in the working environment itself, as soon as you start shivering and feeling really cold, right there, you can't perform your work. You can't really do what you're supposed to do, whether it's manual dexterous work or even shoveling or doing anything uh, more demanding because you simply can. And therefore, and you're not even close to shivering, uh, sorry, I'm hyperthermia at that point. So, but it the work environment tells you to stop and then you move on. So really hyperthermia is not a, a big concern that particular field. Uh, something that's a little bit more um, uh, present would be uh, chilled lanes, which is essentially an irritation from just exposing uh, certain parts of, of your body, so parts of your skin, to heat and cold and back and forth. And in doing so, it does create some slight irritation, and you might have some redness on your skin for a week or two, which heals quite fast and is generally not an issue. And most people that work outside have those regularly. Um, Frostbite is not much of an issue either uh, over time because again, before you get frostbite, you generally feel a lot of pain, a lot of discomfort, and you get to the point where you lose all sensations. And afterwards, you develop deep frostbite. Uh, and of course, worst of cases of frostbite, you're looking at amputation. But again, before you get to that point, there are a lot of steps that are being triggered to tell you that whatever you do is impeding your capacity to work and even gets painful. 
Um, and if anybody's interested uh, into trench foot, again, you have a lot of literature provided by those national, national health and safety bodies, but the reality is that trench foot is something that was uh, an issue in World War I, World War II, and since then, the main issue in trench foot is for festival doors. So if you want to play in the mud for hours and days at a time, then that can be an issue, but other than that, uh, this is not something that's really reported anymore, but it's still something that you will find on uh, national health and safety body websites. And just to put everything into perspective, I'd like to go back to my Montreal uh, Naked Running Man. Uh, for anybody who's been reading the news, again, it was a year or two years ago, uh, there was a, a man, as you can as you can imagine, <laughs> <laughs> who uh, was running in the middle of the night in the north end of Montreal just to get his, he was just jogging, and he was doing the same route every night at some point. Some people kind of got up to take picture of him to send to the police, but I'm not sure that was the only purpose just to, to report him, uh, but at the end of the day, I, I just feel this is a great example of how, again, if you just listen to your body, and in this man, he was exercising, producing a lot of heat, and even in quite cold temperatures, he kept going back over and over again. This is not a dangerous environment. So again, um, individuals working in a cold environment, as long as some min minimal steps are taken, generally, this is quite safe. Which brings me to the next step of this talk, which now, after we've reviewed some of the, the more acute issues that we face and that we recommend to be careful with. So what are the extensions of these issues and where does it bring us? So what are our workers are facing more chronically? So we're gonna talk briefly about cardiovascular stress, so, uh, which will be followed by some immune and endocrine functions as well as some metabolism. So the present model is a classic thermoregulatory model demonstrating uh, blood volume redistribution based on your environment. So on the left, we can observe an individual that uh, to improve his ability to lose heat has blood redirected to his or her extremities. And so more blood volume, warm blood sent to your fingers and your toes, arms and legs has a better ability to release heat. Um, where oppositely on the right hand side in the core, what you see is a redistribution of blood volume to your core. And by core, I mean your heart, your brain, as well as your vital organs. And in doing so, then you achieve the opposite effect. So you're actually trying to prevent losing heat by just sending a lot of blood to areas that can actually lose a lot of that heat. So those changes, although they're designed to protect us uh, from our environment, also include a cascade of responses, uh, including some of them that can be slightly detrimental. And so for the first one, and we're going to go on the cold side of things just to get going, we're going to talk about blood pressure. So that redirection of blood to the core increases the amount of blood that's actually that the heart has to pump. And so generally speaking, when you're, you have this, and I'm going to put this into a different perspective, you have one deciliter of blood in a cup right now that you kind of feel the heart every single time. Now you're shoving a lot more into the same bucket. That the heart has to deal with for every single time it pumps and it can be quite challenging so it's pushing on the vascular walls it's pushing on the ventricular walls in the heart itself and it's it creates this this increase in internal pressure which is similar to exercise in itself it's not that bad and we're talking here about chronic exposure that can be an issue but what we have here on uh, the figures here so on the, your left hand side you have uh, measures of uh, blood pressure taken centrally so in the heart area Whereas on the right, you have brachial uh, blood pressure taken on the arm, which is something that you take at the pharmacy or at home. And in both cases, what you have is, and again, this is somebody that was not exercising, that was simply just in a cold environment that had a sudden increase in blood pressure. And you have a few individual responses that you see in black, where the average of the entire group were, are in gray. And it didn't matter whether you were hypertensive or you had normal blood pressure, you had this increase. And so what it means is if you're already a hypertensive person, you get, let's say you're just pre-hypertensive, you're now going just in a cold environment to stage two hypertension. And if you start exercising afterwards or performing physical work, this is where it can become quite dangerous. If you are a healthy person and have a healthy blood pressure, just by being suddenly in a cold environment, you're now pre-hypertensive. So there's no, there's no great benefits to that at this point. So it can be chronically quite a, quite a challenge. And I'd like to point out very importantly that uh, this particular data set, when I say cold exposed, I'm not talking to Montreal men guy, I'm talking just individuals that are fully dressed, they only have their face opened up for cold temperature. So it was simply some wind in their face that created this response. So it's what, again, and what it means in greater, uh, on a greater spectrum is that it's nearly everybody that goes outside in wintertime, even though you're well dressed, because most of us have our face exposed to a cold environment. 
So what temperature are we talking then? If I do recall, it will be, I don't remember the specifics of that study. It was not that cold. It was, I think, minus 10, minus 20-ish with a light wind. Not, not extreme. Not extreme, nope. Uh, another cardiovascular issue with cold is something that some of you may be familiar with, which affects approximately 5% of the population. It's called Raynaud's disease. Uh, to understand it better, we need to understand how we do have small structures uh, spread all across our bodies. Uh, and these structures help bypass some uh, vascular beds. And so if you see on the left-hand side here, you have capillary beds in white that are essentially the small blood vessels that irrigate everything muscles and fat and nerves and everything else and these sometimes are so small and I'm, I should almost apologize because I saw some great uh, microscopic videos this week where you can see one cell traveling at a time in each of those capillary beds they're that small it's only one cell at a time but it, they are so small that it can literally irrigate all cells and this is why you generally remain healthy but in a cold environment or environment of stress where there's a little bit of constriction of these vessels then essentially you have no blood going through but to support ongoing blood flow, you have these little bypasses sections there that are called arteriovenous anastomoses or AVAs. And so generally speaking, even in the cold environment, those AVAs still are able to provide a little bit of circulation across those vascular beds to be able to join arterial and venous blood. In some individuals, what you have is again, for people with Raynaud's, is a condition that vascular spasm from, school, from cold is so strong that it prevents those AVAs from remaining open and it just shut down very, very quickly. And because of that, again, these are people that have their extremities, mainly fingers and toes, although it can be also eyelids, lips and ears, that shuts down to a point where there's literally no circulation whatsoever. And because of that, this is what you see on the right-hand side, individuals suffering from Raynaud's, that you need to keep your hands and your toes or whatever region of your body is affected warm at all time and if this is not taken care of in some people this can lead to amputation uh, and the worst of the cases if people even midsummer or a day like later this afternoon we're expecting approximately 15 degrees celsius or so and it feels quite warm and these people again just a little bit of, of a cold brisk might actually induce this this spasm response and everything is going to shut down so they're very very sensitive and again in the cold environment you never know what can happen Let's go back on the heat side. So when we look at the cardiovascular effects of heat, we need to go back to our thermoregulatory model. Now we're shifting all that blood back to the extremities, hands and feet and everything else to try to release some heat. Um, in doing so, what we do now, so that cup of blood that we had, or that, sorry, that deciliter of blood that we had in the heart every single time it pumps, now we're cutting it in half. We just add a little bit of blood, but hardly anything. But we still need to deliver oxygenated blood to our entire body still. And so to do that, now your heart needs to pump faster. So if we just uh, remain seated here today and we would just crank up the temperature here from that lovely 22 degree all the way to, let's say, 42 degree, every single one of you right now will have your heart rate going up. Now that in itself is not the end of the world, although it's challenging for some people that might suffer from cardiovascular diseases. Uh, if you are doing a little bit of work through that, now what you have over time is this incapacity of your heart to keep up with that demand. And then what you have is what's called cardiac insufficiency. So if you just start to work a little bit more harder and harder, not really, not strenuously hard, but just hard enough that at some point your heart stops pumping enough blood for the metabolic demand of your body. And in doing so, you fatigue a lot, quick, a lot more quickly. And in some people, this might lead to syncope or extreme fatigue. Now, I mentioned earlier that heat stroke is generally not a concern in a heat place or in, in the occupational uh, environment where heat is an issue because we have a lot of science before we get to that. But in certain settings, and I'm, talk and I'm thinking some um, athletic settings such as a marathon, for example, you have, um, this is essentially designed to resist and to ignore all these signs and to push for performance. And in doing so, it's not always a good idea. We all have set a set of thresholds, specific threshold to determine when our body tells us to stop. And so we have people in our labs and in many labs around the world are looking at exercise and heat stress that essentially we want to know when is your body essentially telling you you can't do it anymore because you're simply too warm. Not because you can't push anymore, but your body is just too warm to perform. And in 
most of us, this ranges between approximately 38.5 degrees Celsius and 40 degrees Celsius. Generally, the smaller you are, the less heat you can retain, so you can perform better. The more fit you are, the, the greater you are at releasing heat, so the better it gets again. But the general population looking at 35 to 40 degrees Celsius. Uh, in highly adapt heat adapted and fit people, it can go a little bit above 40. There's been a few ca rare cases, but knowing that uh, enzymes and, and, and this, this, the cell inner working essentially starts to fail between 41 and 42 degrees, there's hardly a few that can actually sustain anything above 40 degrees. Which um, leads us to uh, something a little bit more gruesome uh, within the presentation, but this is a liver picture of a mouse that was heat exposed at 41.7 degrees for a short period of time. Uh, and I believe this, uh, this picture was taken approximately three days after the heat stroke event. And again, when we say heat stroke, it's not heat stroke for three days. It was heat exposed for approximately an hour, maybe two hours, and that was it. And then the, the mouse was cooled down, and then it was essentially trying to survive. It died eventually. And one of the reasons is the breakdown of enzymes, blood coagulations, and the breakdown of cells at high temperature that can affect nearly all tissues. And this is essentially what you see on the left-hand side, a very healthy liver and on the right, a very unhealthy, nearly dead liver. This one here represents the endothelial lining of your digestive tract. And so for the same set of mice, what you have over an hour is the progressive degradation of the inner gut lining. And so for those that aren't familiar, so your gut essentially lined up with VLI, so it's like finger-like structures that are everywhere and each of these structures have little hair. So it helps somewhat filter everything that it needs within the bloodstream while keeping everything that's bad out. And what you can see over time, at 30 minutes, it starts to degrade quite significantly. At 45, it gets even worse. And at 60, there's hardly any VLI left. And that is just from one heat stroke event. It's not getting better. Let's look at the kidneys. So what you see here, on the left-hand side is healthy kidney pre-heat stroke. And on the right-hand side, post-heat stroke, again, within the same set of mice, um, absolutely destroyed tubules and whatever structure was left is evidently damaged. And again, same heat stroke, same set of mice, a lot of cellular destruction. Now, we can somewhat do this in mice or certain animals because we can actually decide that they can remain heat exposed or have a heat stroke for a certain type of amount of time, but we evidently can't do that in humans. Um, so being able to find uh, human data and see how these effects translate into a human model can be quite challenging. Uh, luckily enough, there are some researchers that are capable of, of getting some of that data and uh, a group from quite a few years ago uh, did follow up a person that had a heat stroke and if you look closely at the picture here the middle picture shows a clear structure of the cerebellum at the back here and that looks fairly healthy just a few days if not a week after a heat stroke event and that's almost one year after the heat stroke where the rear of the brain the cerebellum here kept degrading which is a surprising finding and this is something that um, when you think about this, even post event in, in, in a person that we, and sorry, let's go back a little bit. Cerebellum uh, is primarily used for motion coordination. It's a critical part of your brain. And what this describes here for one heat stroke event, this individual had specific brain functions, not necessarily just functions, but brain structures that kept degradating over a year. Now how this translated later on to, within his life, I'm, I, we're not sure. But the reality is, and right now this is just one structure in this body, but some structures, it's not an acute event, it's a chronic event that can last for many, many years. Now let's be a little bit less gruesome and move on to endocrine and immune function. It's a little bit more happy now. Uh, so why do we care about the system? Well, it kind of dictates whether or not you're likely to be sick. Uh, absenteeism at work have a high cost in some industries for both employees and employers, right? So um, it's simply better to have everybody healthy. So both systems work closely together. So we have uh, whatever you're in a thermal environment and uh, you're exposed to cold, exposed to heat, and so you're releasing some hormones and these hormones will act on you know, certain immune cells. Uh, they will secrete some cytokines, other immunomediators, and they are all interacting with one another. 
So it's a very overall kind of broad system. Um, and we have, or we're a little bit more aware of the effects of physical activity or physical work on uh, immune responses as well and overall immunity. Um, what we didn't know and we're still struggling to know is how cold and heat independently affect this set of systems. Uh, because we do know that, you know, the healthier you are, the less likely you are to have, to have infections, illnesses, and any pathologies. And again, we want to keep people healthy. And so early work by, uh, by Nieman uh, factored immunity by using records of respiratory tract infections. And so he wanted to know how people were getting sick. And so what he did is look at how, how many respiratory tract infections people were getting. And so what he somewhat looked at is say, well, if you're sedentary and not moving too much, and let's say you, you are getting an average rate of infections. If you are exercising on a regular basis, moderate exercise intensity, uh, moderate uh, intensity exercise, sorry, you tend to be, or you tend to have less respiratory tract infections. So you tend to have a healthier immune system, great. But if you keep pushing really, really hard, like high intensity exercise, high volume, then you actually, on a short term anyway, you tend to get more sick. And so uh, strenuous exercise models have been developed afterward, knowing that it would provide such profound responses in the immune system. So they've been used afterwards to look at very, uh, a lot of bits and pieces into the immune system. And so uh, here on the right hand side, we have a series of cytokine productions following, during and following one bout of strenuous exercise. And I can, as you can see, that's just a handful of dozens and dozens of markers that we have access to. And so it can be quite challenging at some point to determine, like, are you healthier? Are you not as healthy based on certain types of exercise or all the functions? So it's hard to kind of combine everything. So the few pieces that we have anyway are leading us to this. So number one, in the heat, um, what we know is, again, based on that differences in the gut lining that we just described, that change in gut permeability or what's been called as well a leaky gut can actually increase your chances of a bacteria or some pathogens to cross that lining back into your bloodstream. So exercising in the heat, by definition, makes you more likely to get a bacteria within your cells. Now, it's not really your immune system per se that's challenged, but it's a side effect of in the heat and then your immune system has to deal with it. Um, on the right hand side, what you have are toll -like, uh, a toll-like receptor. And uh, it tends to have reduced activity in the heat. Now, these receptors are located on monocytes, monocytes being a, uh, a necessary white blood cell, very useful for the immune system. And then these uh, toll like receptors are embedded within the monocytes. And these little folks that you see there are critical pieces that help identify pathogens that are circulating around. And so if you have these particular structures that suddenly now don't work as well and can't recognize little bits and pieces in your bloodstream, then you're less likely to be able to fight any infections or bacteria. So these are somewhat two mechanisms that we're a little bit more sure how in the heat it can be, it can be affected. In the cold environment, a few years ago, what we did is, uh, as opposed to look at, at one or two mechanisms, we tried to look at a very wide spectrum of markers. So we had all these pro and anti-inflammatory cytokines and growth, uh, growth factors, and we somewhat, instead of looking one by one, and start to break down what they each do, we try to combine them into a large group and say overall, how are they influencing your immune system? Um, it wasn't that easy to interpret really. Uh, I know there's a lot in that graph here, but I mean here, what we did is look at the individuals that were working at a low intensity exercise and moderate intensity exercise within each group. And within each activities, we had people, um, under uh, thermal neutral environments, under the cold, and people that were also shivering. Because when you define cold, it's cold again is different for everybody. And so are you shivering, are you not shivering, are you just a little chill, are you just freezing dead? So there are these differences. So we wanted to expand that a little bit and just say, are you simply working in a cold environment but producing enough heat to make sure you don't go into a hypothermic state? Or are you really, really cold and then doing some work? And so what we saw, uh, at the beginning is, well, exercising in a thermal environment, so did elicit a stronger response and a large array of endocrine and immune measures. And there was an immunodepressive effect from the cold uh, on exercise-related immunodepressive responses. So essentially, from, from what we see here, when you were exercising in a cold environment, you tend to have a suppressed immune response. Uh, in terms of the shivering itself, surprisingly, the presence of shivering before the exercise um, induce an immunostimulatory effect similar to the thermal neutral environment. 
So it kind of went the opposite way. So the exact mechanisms for this are unknown, but this is just to show that it's quite a challenging and a challenging type of work to do because there's so many markers, there's so many responses and different types of heat, different types of cold, that there's a lot of work to be done and to combine all this to get a better picture. But there are significant changes. Um, now we just take a look at how heat and cold uh, can influence endocrine uh, and immune functions. But we need to extrapolate that to, um, to something a little bit bigger. So we do know that you mean, within your immune uh, function, you do have inflammation as a response. And if you are chronically exposed to heat and chronically exposed to cold, you might be chronically uh, inflamed or have this inflammatory response. And this is a field of study that's uh, growing in popularity because we are now having more and more information how chronic inflammation really influences people's health and generally in a very bad way. And so here, just to name a few of the detrimental effects of chronic inflammation, you're looking at some, a lot of neurological disorders, uh, diabetes, some metabolic disorders, uh, chronic pain, mental health issues, cardiovascular issues, as well as cancer. And that's just being chronically exposed to an agent of some kind that creates this chronic inflammation. And again, the same can be said if you don't sleep well for long periods of time, if you eat poorly for long periods of time. So all of these elements that can be combined to chronic inflammation, but we now know that thermal stress can also induce that. All right, a little bit more happy again. So let's discuss some effects on thermal stress on metabolism. So. As most of you know, so in, uh, in our cells, we have those little kind of small organelles called mitochondria that are producing all our energy. And to do so, they do need some substrate, they do need some fuel. So the fuels that they use, mostly when we're sitting here today, and most of our days, it's fat, as you can see on the top right-hand side. And so fat is fueling those little organelles, and in return, they work really hard for us to give the energy we need to work. So whether, again, it is sitting at a desk and tapping all day, or shoveling something, or carrying equipment. Um, these organelles also rely a little bit on sugar. So again, during the day, it doesn't use that much sugar, but if you are, um, if you have some types of pathologies in those mitochondria, you may rely more heavily on sugars, or if you work really, really hard during strenuous exercise. So how does the environment change that? So when you are working in a warm environment, there's a tendency, we've seen a tendency to shift, uh, the energy to shift towards more sugars. And so suddenly, instead of relying on fat, Unfortunately, now your body wants to use more sugar. We don't have that much sugars in our body. We have a little bit, which unfortunately, over time, what happens is if you use too much of that sugar, you get tired a lot more quickly because sugars are really tidying with the sensation of fatigue. Uh, and one of the reasoning behind that is the activation of what's called heat shock protein. So you have these little proteins in your cells that under heat, they're more activated, they're a lot more active, and their activity tends to inhibit aerobic metabolism, the type of metabolism that really relies on fat. And in, because if you wanted to do the exact same amount of work, so let's say you are again carrying heavy gear from point A, point one, I'm sorry, point, uh, point a to point B for hours, and then now you have these proteins being activated, then instead of the exact same work that you do, you'll now simply be using a lot more sugar. Um, what we were interested years ago is to see, well, you know, it's been looked at what happens in the heat, you use more sugar now, if you do the exact same thing, but we've now shifted the cold environment, what happens? Uh, so we had a study where people were walking and running in a cold and thermoneutral environment. So cold, we were at zero degrees Celsius, and thermoneutral, we were at 22 degrees Celsius. And again, in all conditions, people were simply wearing shorts and t-shirts, and you'd be surprised to know that people at zero degrees Celsius with short, shorts and t-shirts still had an increase in core temperature, it still felt warm at the end. Um, so they were doing so for an hour, and what we've measured is when they were actually working in a cold environment, the contribution of fat to the total energy that they were, do that they were using was much greater. So again, we had this opposite response, and we're very happy to see that, that when you are performing in a cold environment, you are relying more on fat. So that answered somewhat part of the first question. Um, the Next question that we had is, well, now that we've done this somewhat at the same intensity, now does that really reflect everyone for everything? Not really, because we want to know people that do very easy work, people that do kind of moderate intensity work, people that do very heavy work, and how we can translate all that through the entire intensity spectrum, because all works are different. And we saw similar responses again, where, you know, as they are, the more they exercise, as exercise becomes more and more challenging, they still rely more on fat across the entire exercise spectrum. 
Uh, so more fat was used and we're pretty happy with that. And of course, we didn't forget women. Uh, women have a tendency to burn and oxidize more fat compared to men. So we thought we were somewhat wondering if similar, similar responses would be seen. Um, and again, we saw very, very similar responses with simply greater fat oxidation. So we were happy to see that for both men and women, we have this shift in fat oxidation for people that are cooled down, which can be quite beneficial for your health because we did the more fat you burn, the healthier your, those little organelles in mitochondria tend to be. So how does that translate to the workplace? And I didn't, I didn't do a full feel to lap to feel, I just did lap to feel, I hope it's enough. Uh, so we know more clearly that if you work in a warm place, you have a tendency to utilize more sugars again. And since we don't store that much in our bodies, so we do need to replenish them. Uh, and concerning the cold again, you rely more on fat, so you, you have, most of us, plenty of fat, unfortunately, so we have more than enough reserves, so we're going to work for a long time. Now, that in itself is not that groundbreaking, but what we were able to add to the literature on this, which really helps in the workplace, is the fact that now we can spread those components into a different spectrum of uh, work intensity. As was said before, again, if you are simply the manager on, on, a, uh, on a construction site and, get, you know, helping some guys getting things done, but you essentially mainly giving orders, then you know that your work intensity is fairly low. But then if you're the guy carrying the big beams from point to point B, we can still look within the curve where you are and where your energy uh, spending should be and maybe have some mitigating strategies in case you feel fatigued and not so well in doing so. Uh, in continuing with this, so what we're hoping to do in the next little while, we, we have a um, currently completing a metabolomic study where we really want to look at the small bits and pieces that somewhat control all that. We have the main mechanisms. We have a good idea where to go. Uh, in partnerships with uh, Thomas Burton Biology and other people, we really want to have a better spectrum. Yes, glasses will be necessary on this one. Uh, we really want to know how this all happens and see if there's something we can do as precisely as we can. Uh, so one of my last slides of the day, uh, just as something that for me is rather important, a part of the message here. Um, we have, all of us, a sense of what's called brown, uh, brown adipose tissue, brown fat. And this is something that we've known, or anatomists have known for a long, long time, because looking at cadavers, essentially you can extract bits and pieces and you know how the body is made. Uh, and there were only a handful of studies way back where they were actually trying to do some biopsies of that fat to try to analyze it. But because it was really difficult to get, it was really difficult to yield any useful information. Um, and by complete accident, the story is anyway, complete accident, uh, Nearly 10 years ago, a group of researchers actually accidentally found via imaging location of brown fat in adult humans uh, to determine that they are located primarily in the supraclavicular area as well as the spine and that they serve a very useful purpose in all of us. They tend to actually create a lot more heat compared to other structures, other fat, for example. And so it's a type of fat that has a lot of mitochondria in it. And because it's got a lot of mitochondria in it, it has the ability in the cold environment to actually heat up a lot. And if you look at some people that um, can go outside without a shirt and it's the middle of the winter and say, what are you doing? And they're not shivering, and they're feeling great. Well, chances are there are people that have more brown fat. What we also know about this brown fat is that the more you have, the thinner you are and the healthier you are metabolically. Um, and on top of the game, what we also know is that the more you are outside, the more you're exposed to cold, the more activated these, uh, these brown fat remain. And so if you spend time outside, if you actually spend time being chilled once in a while, not always focusing on being inside and warm, you are actually keeping your brown, uh, your brown cells, your brown fat, for a longer period of time in your life. Because we do know that it disappears over time. And if you take a picture of a 20-year-old man or a 20-year-old woman and, and its elderly counterpart at 60 or 70-year-old, um, the 60, 70 year old counterpart will have zero brown fat whatsoever or hardly anything. But the more time you spend in a cold environment or challenging uh, these brown fat, the longer you will remain, you, you will keep them. And so my last slide of the day, after mumbling quite a few things out of fatigue, um, this is something for most of us here. We do know that if you do get cold, you have a very small range of, of play in terms of physical work. You just have a decrease in core temperature of about 0.5 degrees or so. You already work, uh, you can't work. 
you're comfortable, you start to shiver. I mean, your work capacity has greatly, greatly diminished. You have a little bit more of a play in terms of uh, if you get warmer by one, maybe two degrees Celsius, it's not that much. Uh, but the fact remains that your work performance and work capacity decreases sharply in either direction. This is why it's really important to do our best to try to remain at 37 degrees Celsius when we do our work. So there's one final message I'd like to pass on for today. So just effort needs to be made in the workplace to maintain thermal neutral body temperature to limit the acute and chronic, as well as potentially detrimental effects of deviating from optimal body temperature. From this, I'd like to thank you guys for being here today. Thank you. So we do have time for, for questions if you're open uh, to them. Of course. Um, for those of you who are online, at the bottom of your screen, you should see a little chat uh, button that if you had a question, you wanted to hit the chat button and uh, type in a question, we can relay those to uh, Dr. Daniel. But uh, if you're back, we're open here to see if there's anyone. I think if you speak up, everyone yeah, I think online should be able to, to hear it also. You can, I had one question in the back of my mind, but you, you kind of answered it in your last slide when you, when you spoke about like the optimal temperature range that you should keep and you know, uh, 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 suggestions for the workplace, but maybe just your opinion or what you might see um, as far as legislation goes and, and even just like maybe different, uh, different workplace policies. Do you think there's a, there's a place for there to be maybe stricter or more controls on how time spent certain or being in hotter environments. I know the cold that you're stressing with being cold now and so that, but being in hotter environments you should change the legislation. Well, I think in terms of legislation, um, this is not, what, what I could say for that is one of the main challenges that we're all facing at all, at all point in time is to make sure we have adequate data of people, like real-time data of people working in the environment. That's the most challenging part. So, uh, let's say we want to use the ingestible pail for cold temperature and say that would be your main variable marker. We still need a group of individuals that can adequately use them, that can act adequately record what's going on in real time to be able to make decisions. Um, and so it, I don't think it's a policy issue. I think it's just a monitoring issue, being able to really determine what's going on in each workplace. And I think this is what we're, I mean, we're doing here at Crosh. Other groups are, are, are doing quite effectively, but it does take time to make sure that we have all this information together to subsequently be able to maybe have a legislation or have some suggestions to be able to make it more consistent that way. Right, because it might be like a more individual problem, right? Like some, some folks may be able to work and perform that might not just like, because that might not work for everyone. And, and this is why, I mean, we, uh, this is the ongoing debate to have a fitness test for certain particular kind of workers that work in a challenging thermal environment. In the key, for example, we talk about a lot these days about mining rescue, rescue workers, you know, and maybe have fitness testing, maybe control some of their core temperature in certain ways. But again, they all have a different level of fitness. They all have different amount of, of fat that can store that heat. So they all respond quite differently. Right now, one of the best ways you've found to really, not mitigate, but at least monitor that, is to use an ingestible pill. But are we ready to have the structure to do this on every single, um, in every single workplace? This is a question we need to ask ourselves. Or if there's better tools we can develop to do that. Are you open for me to read one from uh, online? So the, the question is, uh, does regular exposure to heat uh, then reduce brown fat. You, you sort of talked about the impact of you know cold of this yeah. and then so are there follow up? Is there have there been any uh, sort of population based studies on on brown fat distribution between those who live in more predominantly cold versus warm environments? This is an excellent question. As far as I know, there's no literature on this whatsoever, so I can't really answer to that. All I can say is that those that tend to be more cold exposed tend to keep brown fat more. Is it the opposite, or do we lose more rapidly, for example? Like that, I, I couldn't say we don't have a literature on this. This is an excellent question and it would be very useful in the future. Absolument. Le degré d'adaptation, encore une fois, de chaque individu peut dépendre de leur capacité cardiorespiratoire de base. Euh, les données que j'ai brièvement présentées, on parle encore une fois d'un groupe, donc pas d'individus. 
ce qui, est, euh, ce qui encore une fois, est difficile à vraiment être capable de généraliser certains concepts à tout le monde. Mais c'est ce qu'on c'est une affirmation qu'on peut se dire euh, qu'on devrait voir dans la majorité des, des individus mais à, quel, à quel degré ou à quelle, quelle quantité de ça, ça c'est encore une fois. Très so, there, there's a couple other comments on, online. I'll put them through. So there's one, and I, and I actually thought of it uh, as you were presenting. You know, I, I remember my my grandma all the time. You know, put your head on, you're gonna get a cold if you go out there. You know, so there so there is some truth to that. Is what I'm getting. Right? So if your grandma was like, listen, if you're not dressing up warm enough for your cold temperatures, unless you're a Montreal man, then so there's some, some truth to that. Well, again, again, I think that's only part of the data. Uh, Again, this is where we added the shivering part, where you, you know, getting really, really cold instead of immunosuppressive, it had this uh, immunostimulatory effect. So again, and again, it was within a large group of people that was uh, also a lot of uh, immunomodulators and cytokine combined together. So it's it's not a clear cut response because it's really hard to analyze so many variables and how they all interact. At the end of the day, when we go back to the original research of just first person track infections or in any infections, regardless of what's going on with your immune system. Are you getting infected? Are you getting sick? That that should be kind of the main marker variable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then I, I suppose so that <clears throat> then there's another comment around um, around brown fat and, and can you speak to the role, the role maybe of, of of your genetics of, of sort of what's, how much you start with as your as your baseline is there yeah. um, is that is there, is there much that's been looked at there or, or do we all sort of get dealt the same amount? Uh, uh, just like everything else in life, yeah. for some of us, it's just flat out unfair. Yeah. Um, this is not my main field of work, so I, I don't want to uh, dive too much into this. However, um, infants, for example, have no capacity to shiver. So one of their reasons to be able to keep warm is they have a lot more brown fat. So we know that in, in, uh, in infants and children, their brown fat volume for their body volume overall is a lot higher. Yeah. And this tends to disappear over time, and as you get old, as you get old, as you become an elderly, you do lose that mass. Um, but again, in terms of how we do keep it all, again, genetically speaking, we're all different, right? We all have different footprints on each cell, and consequently, it's kind of hard to dictate how this plays out over the years. I mean, it's like anything else. I mean, you have an exercise response. You have a hundred people doing the same training regimen in a gym. And guess what? You're going to have some people that are going to be responding really, really well. They're going to be really, really fit. And you're going to have some people that will have barely no benefits just because the training was not designed specifically for them, right? They respond differently. So as a whole, we know that being exposed to cold seems to be uh, maintaining brown post tissue volume better over time. Is it the case for everybody? I like it. But there may be one or two more that we can, we'll take offline after because they're just mindful of the time for those who are online. Uh, I'll just plug uh, that our next webinar is uh, May 30th, uh, and we will have Dr. Catherine Sin 